Thank you, Howard. Our first speaker today, we turn to something of a new subject, the subject of the Inklings. You've heard of the Inklings. Some of you are very knowledgeable about that little group. Uh, some of us, that may be fairly new information, but we are honored today to turn to this subject because it was so very much an influence in the life not only of C.S. Lewis, but in the lives of others as well. And there are lessons to be learned from that. When we reached out to find someone who could particularly speak on this, our mind and attention was drawn to Dr. Diana Pavlik Glyer. She is the distinguished professor of English at Azusa Pacific University in the country of California. Oh, wait a minute. I Anyway, she's come the longest distance of any of our speakers with the exception of Doug Grisham, and we are honored to have her here. She is uh, well known as a writer on a number of subjects, but particularly with the Inkling. So Diane, we welcome you to Montreat. Well, it's hard to believe, but when C.S. Lewis graduated from Oxford University, he had a hard time getting a job. He graduated in 1922 with a degree in classical languages and literature. Now, the program that he was part of has been described as the flagstone of Oxford's undergraduate program. As Alistair McGrath has pointed out, students in the classics program were expected to engage with the literary, historical, and philosophical riches of the classical age, all in their original languages. That was the program, and C.S. Lewis excelled at it. This program is seen as more than the accumulation of information. It was considered a gateway to wisdom, a way of thinking about life's great questions. Even though he had done really well as an undergrad, he couldn't find a job. So he decided that he would go back to school and increase his chances by getting a, another degree. And this degree was in English literature. Now, the English literature program at Oxford generally takes three years to complete. Lewis finished it in nine months. And then he went back on the job market and still nothing. So C.S. Lewis did a little tutoring. He put an ad in the classifieds and tutored various students. He took a temp job as a substitute teacher in philosophy. And finally, in 1925, he was elected to a full-time position as a don at Maudlin College in Oxford. So C.S. Lewis was a rookie, an absolute rookie, in the lowest possible academic rank in his very first year, at his very first job, when he met J.R.R. Tolkien at a faculty meeting. Now, this was 1925, and this was Tolkien's first year on the faculty at Oxford. But Tolkien had already had five years of teaching experience. He had been at Leeds University, a school roughly 150 miles north of Oxford. And while he was there, Tolkien held a position of professor of English language. Now, as you know, the university system in Britain is quite different from that in the States. And so to be uh, named a professor was considered a very high honor. They were rare and significant. Even more, this position had been created specifically for Tolkien in recognition of his established work as a scholar and as a teacher. And then he moved to Oxford, where Tolkien occupied another senior post. He was professor of English language at Oxford, but he was also the chair of Anglo-Saxon. So while Tolkien held one of the highest ranks at the university, Lewis was a junior member and brand new to his position. 
So the first thing I like to emphasize when I talk about Lewis and Tolkien is how really different they were. I've tried to paint a picture of some of these differences. They were different in age. Tolkien was roughly six years older. And here at the beginning, they were different in their teaching experience, in their scholarly achievement, and in their academic rank. But these early differences are not the only differences between these two men. There were important differences in their academic disciplines. Now, when most people think about academic disciplines, they think about a body of information that needs to be accumulated or mastered. But the best way to understand an academic discipline is it's a kind of lens through which people view the world and ask and answer questions. Now, as I mentioned, Lewis's training was in the history and philosophy of classical literature. And then he also took a degree in English literature. He was a literary scholar. And many of his greatest works are works of literary scholarship. These include The Allegory of Love, A Preface to Paradise Lost, English Literature in the 16th Century, and one of my absolutely favorite C.S. Lewis books, a book I am so enthusiastic about. I hope that you, you'll read it if you haven't already. It's a book called An Experiment in Criticism. And that book lays out Lewis's understanding of how to be a great reader of great books. He sees so much of what, um, what makes a book great is not in the text, but in how we interact with it. And he elaborates that beautifully in his book, An Experiment in Criticism. Tolkien, on the other hand, was a linguist by training and a philologist by inclination. In short, Rather than being devoted to literature, Tolkien loved language itself. Now, one of Tolkien's earliest experiences of being enthralled with language happened when he was just seven years old. He wrote a short story about a green, great dragon. And he showed the story to his mother, and she said, it's a wonderful piece of writing, but in English, grammatically speaking, you are not allowed to say a green, great dragon. You have to say a great green dragon. Well, this really bothered him. The proper order of adjectives. This was a linguistic puzzle that really intrigued him. And this incident launched him on the serious study of linguistic principles in order to explain why this was the case. And so, fueled by his passionate curiosity, by the age of 20, Tolkien had already mastered a number of languages, not just English, but also Welsh, Anglo-Saxon, Spanish, Latin, French, German, and Finnish. But not only that, Tolkien, by the age of 20, had already invented four languages of his own. Tolkien continued to invent languages for nearly 60 years. And these were not just a handful of vocabulary words that he used to sprinkle into his stories to give them some sort of verisimilitude. These are full languages with grammatical structures, with regional dialects. In fact, there is a conference held every year where scholars in Tolkien's languages present papers about Tolkien's languages in Tolkien's languages. <laughs> now, you may know that Tolkien was not only a scholar and a writer, but he was also an artist. And with his languages, he also invented beautiful alphabets to go with them. Now, this language here, this is called Tengwar. The word Tengwar is the Elvish word for letters. And this uh, language was usually used to express uh, two of Tolkien's invented languages, Quenya and Sindarin, although Tolkien used it a lot just to take notes in English. <laughs> this is another one of his languages, a runic alphabet called Kirth. Uh, it is, um, in the age of the ring, the War of the Ring, this language was primarily used by the dwarfs. This was the sort of thing that he loved. In short, language was Tolkien's passion. 
As a professor at Oxford, he declared that, quote, language is the real thing in schools, end quote. Now, I want you to think about this, those of you who are educators or who speak into schools and education systems. Tolkien believed very strongly that language study was the basis of a liberal arts education. And he vigorously promoted an entire curriculum that was based on the study of language, believing that if people understood the structures of linguistics, then they could read anything well. It was the only proper foundation for a good education. Not only that, but Tolkien uh, wrote his first professional publications as works of linguistics. Uh, a Middle English vocabulary is his first important publication. It's basically a glossary of Middle English words. He also was inordinately proud of himself for writing a lot of the entries in the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, there's stories that are somewhat apocryphal, but I sort of believe them anyway. And that's that when people got into arguments, one of the things that Tolkien liked to do is give the definition of a word, and when he was questioned, he would say, stop, stop, I know what I'm talking about. I wrote the OED. <laughs> well, we've looked at a number of academic differences. I'd like to also consider how different these men were in their faith journey. In the spring of 1926, when they met, C.S. Lewis was not yet a Christian. In fact, he had just published his second book, a long narrative poem called Dimer. And in the poem, Lewis attacks Christianity, treating it as an illusion that must be overcome and destroyed in one's life. And back a few years earlier in his first book, Spirits in Bondage, Lewis wrote a number of poems that are angry and defiant and frankly quite painful to read because his bitterness is palpable, as in this excerpt of a poem called De Profundis. Lewis writes, Come, let us curse our master ere we die for all our hopes in endless ruin lie. The good is dead, let us curse God most high. 4,000 years of toil and hope and thought, wherein men labored upward and still wrought new worlds and better, thou hast made as naught. We build us joyful cities, strong and fair, Knowledge we sought and gathered wisdom rare. And all this time you laughed upon our care. Now in stark contrast to Lewis, during the same period, Tolkien was a devout Catholic, sincere in his faith and devoted to reverence, worship, and prayer. In fact, Tolkien had been a devoted Christian since childhood and remained so all of his life. Now, these two differences between Tolkien and Lewis, differences in faith and differences in their academic backgrounds, they may seem minor to us, but they were really huge. Lewis wrote this. He said, my friendship with Tolkien marked the breakdown of two old prejudices. At my first coming into the world, remember he was, uh, I grew up in Northern Ireland. At my first coming into the world, I had been warned never to trust a papist. And at my first coming into the English faculty at Oxford, I had been warned to never trust a philologist. <laughs> Tolkien was both. Well, as years went by, Tolkien was to be instrumental in Lewis's conversion. David Downing yesterday illustrated for us some of the steps in Lewis's faith journey, and Tolkien was very instrumental in that long uh, journey to faith. There's another contrast between Lewis and Tolkien that I'd like to mention, and that's this. They were very different in terms of their temperament. Lewis was known for his robust sense of humor, his booming voice his hearty laugh. He was taller than Tolkien by nearly three inches. Here's a description of him from one of his Oxford colleagues, quoting now. 
Perhaps the first thing you notice about Lewis, he had an extraordinary red complexion. He had rather solid, well-marked features, a clear, emphatic voice. But not only that, he always dressed very informally. He always wore a tweed jacket and flannel trousers, which was at the time the uniform of the undergraduate population." End quote. So here was a teacher who dressed like a student. His old tweed coat, his baggy flannel trousers, and his floppy hat are mentioned in most descriptions of his appearance. He was casual, stocky, emphatic, joyful, loud and boisterous and expressive. C.S. Lewis enjoyed life. He enjoyed people. And he was a man with broad, eclectic tastes. Now, Tolkien was a different sort of person altogether. He was shorter than Lewis. He was five feet, eight inches tall. He was rather slight, thin. He was underweight for most of his life. And he was also always impeccably dressed, from his necktie down to his polished shoes. Tolkien nearly always wore a coat and tie, and he loved to wear colored vests, often vests that were covered with fancy embroidery. One of Tolkien's students described his teacher this way. Tolkien came into the room lightly, gracefully. I always remember that. His academic gown flowing, his fair hair shining. And he read Beowulf out loud. He read like no one else I have ever heard. He was a great teacher and delightful, courteous, and ever so kind, end quote. In contrast to Lewis, Tolkien was slender, pale, serious, detailed, and precise. He described himself as a man of narrow interests and limited sympathies. Now, Robert Havard was a neighbor to the Tolkien family, and he was friends with both Lewis and Tolkien. And he describes the two men this way. Havard says, they were very different men. Lewis was a big, full-blown man, overbearing almost, both in the weight of his personality and in his physical weight. Tolkien was a slight figure, I'd say three quarters of the weight of Lewis. And Tolkien's remarks were always made by the way. His whole manner was elusive rather than direct, whereas Lewis came straight out at you. These are, superficial, fishy, <laughs> these are superficialities, but there's a great difference in mental makeup, end quote. Well, as you might expect, given this catalog of differences, differences in academic background, in faith, and in temperament, the first meeting between Lewis and Tolkien was not particularly promising. I've looked everywhere, and I can't find a single time where Tolkien mentions meeting Lewis. For him, it was kind of a non-event. Can you imagine? It's like, it, was like, it was like it had never happened. On the other hand, C.S. Lewis has become rather notorious for his response to first meeting Tolkien. He wrote down that night that he found Tolkien to be, quote, a pale, fluent chap. Not too bad, he said, but quote, Tolkien needs a good smack. <laughs> well, uh, to say the least, this was not a very auspicious beginning for the two, but things changed when Lewis joined a group that had been founded by Tolkien. The group was called the Coal Biters. It was a club devoted to studying old Icelandic sagas, specifically the Eddas, in their original languages. So they would all have a piece of the text, and they would uh, translate it on the spot, trying to, to translate it into English and then discussing it together. And the first saga that Lewis, Tolkien, and the Kolbiters worked on together was the younger Edda of Snorri Sturluson. And in the original language, it looks something like this. Now, <laughs> now, sitting around reading ancient myths in Old Norse really is not my cup of tea. <laughs> 
But Lewis loved these old stories, and the chance to study them in the original languages was, for Lewis, a lifelong dream come true. Late in life, Lewis wrote another wonderful book called The Four Loves. And in that book, he says that, lo that lovers, romantic lovers, gaze upon one another. Their gaze is inward to the significant other. But friends, friends stand shoulder to shoulder and look outward at a common passion, a common interest. Lewis and Tolkien became friends because of the coal biters. As friends, they were both looking to the north. As Colin Durie puts it, they were enchanted by a vast northern world with pale skies, dragons, and the value of courage against darkness. Together their gaze was fixed on stories, on the Norse sagas that both men had loved all their lives. And this was the forge of their friendship. And that's the second thing I want to emphasize this morning. Not just how different they were, but this idea that their friendship was forged by their devotion to a shared activity. They crossed the bridge of difference that divided them by sitting shoulder to shoulder, pursuing a common interest and in studying stories that both of them loved. That's the second thing, and here's the third. Their friendship deepened as they made a decision to spend time together regularly. Here, here's what happened. After the meetings of the coal biter came to an end, Lewis and Tolkien decided to schedule time to meet together one day a week. It is the smallest, simplest decision that one could make. Once a week, Tolkien would go over to Lewis's rooms, the two men would chat a while, and then they'd walk across to the Eastgate Hotel where they would talk and have lunch. They would chat about school politics. They continued to talk about books they were reading. And Lewis described these regularly, regular Monday meetings as one of the most pleasant spots in his week. Now, after meetings had gone on like this for almost a year, Tolkien made a decision to take their friendship to a different level. Um, we don't have a lot of good evidence about exactly what happened at that meeting, but I picture it something like this. The two men have had their chat, they've had their lunch, they may have indulged in a beer or two. It's December 1929, and it's kind of cold outside, that sort of drizzly cold. And as they stand to leave, Tolkien grabs his big overcoat, and he notices that in the pocket of that overcoat, he has stuffed a copy of a manuscript that he's been working on. It's a manuscript called The Lay of Lathian. It tells the story of Baron and Luthien, one of the key stories in Tolkien's uh, legendarium, the background stories that inform the Lord of the Rings. It tells the story of a man and an elf woman, and these characters, Baron and Luthien, are based on Tolkien's own courtship of his beloved wife, Edith. In fact, when you have a chance to go back to Oxford, and I hope you will, visit their grave, and you'll notice that on Tolkien's grave, it says, Baron and Lucian there, even on that gravestone. The story was so precious, so close to Tolkien's heart. So there he is, and he notices that he's got the manuscript, and he's been laboring over this thing late nights for weeks now. And all of a sudden, he sort of turns back to Lewis and he says, I don't know, something like this. He says, uh, he says, Lewis, I've been working on a poem. I, I've written a poem. Would you like to read it? And I picture Lewis breaking out with a big grin saying, of course, of course, but thinking in his heart, oh, you know, here we go. <laughs> Gonna read my friend's writing, okay? <laughs> so Lewis takes the, I always, I always picture this, I always, I'll always picture Tolkien sort of holding it out to him like this, you know, and Lewis taking it, and Tolkien holding onto it like this, <laughs> and Lewis taking it, and, and, and Tolkien sort of letting it go, you know? It was a, a brave, brave step. 
to share your work in progress, to share a story so close, so dear to your heart. Well, Lewis took that manuscript home and I imagine that probably with a sigh of intention, he sat down to read the thing and he was amazed. He was delighted. He read the whole thing through in one sitting and then sat down to pen a thank you note as quickly as he could. And in that note, which we still have a copy of, he said, it has been ages since I have had an evening of such delight. And then he said, I would have loved this poem if I had found it by accident in a bookstore by an anonymous author. But before he sent that thank you note, that note of praise and encouragement, Lewis added a short PS. And the PS said this, it said, further comments, including quibbles about individual lines, will follow. <laughs> well, Tolkien sat on pins and needles for three weeks, waiting for the quibbles to arrive, and when they did, he was astonished to discover that C.S. Lewis had penned 14 single-spaced pages of comments and quibbles. And not only that, here's the cheeky part. Lewis had rewritten great sections of the poem. <laughs> but here's the marvel of it, and maybe you can guess. Tolkien loved the second letter far better than the first. Because for the first time in his life, he found someone who had taken his vision seriously, who believed in what he was doing who believed in it so strongly that he lavished his very best attention to making sure that that work was the very best it could be, to bring out the best, not only in the poem, but in its author. One of the most important gifts that Tolkien had ever received. Well, that step of courage, Tolkien sharing this poem, Lewis responding with such gracious abundance as a resonator, somebody who fundamentally understands the work and what it's about and what Tolkien was attempting to do and helping him get there. That turning point changed everything because shortly thereafter, December 1929, January 1930, right in that period, Lewis showed up at one of their meetings with some poetry of his own. And it was the exchange of that literature that became the, the core, the kernel, right? The, I think of it as a, a, a grain of sand in the oyster. That's the center of what became the inklings. As the group grew and developed this habit of substantial, specific critique remained a hallmark of the group. Warren Lewis said it was the ethos of the whole thing that critique was abundant and free. They were not vague, and they were not gentle. Michael Farrell is a sociologist and a professor at the State University of New York. He's one of the world's leading experts in the study of creative collaboration. After study studying the inner workings of the Inklings, here's how Michael Farrell describes their weekly meetings. He said, the tone is intellectually competitive. Show no quarter, take no prisoners. It is rough and playful, peppered with teasing <laughs> and insults. Though they provide thoughtful feedback about ideas, the group meetings were not occasions for compassionate support and the sharing of personal concerns. Like many male groups, the exchanges of the Inklings had an undertone of competitive sport, and points were scored through intelligent debate, sarcasm, and humor, but not through destructive attacks on character. Big difference, right? Even so, witty repartee and put-downs were very common. That is a contemporary scholar's take on the nature of the group, what they would have been like to meet with the Inklings. Here's how Tolkien described one of their evenings together. He said it was, quote, a most amusing, 
and highly contentious evening on which, had an outsider eavesdropped, he would have thought it was a meeting of fell enemies hurling deadly insults before drawing their guns. <laughs> the friendship of Lewis and Tolkien illustrates the power and the importance of dyads, that is, pairs of creative individuals who are fundamentally different in temperament, in vision, in background, in training skills and interests, who spend time working together side by side and as a result, accomplish far more than either could on their own. It is common to hear people say that Lewis and Tolkien became friends despite their differences. I'm here today to argue that they became a dynamic creative force because of those differences. I've discovered that when you look beneath the surface and study the history of clubs, organizations, literary movements, and other kinds of collaborative circles, it is actually quite rare to see a group that forms around one dominant creative genius. Most often, collaborative circles, creative clusters, they come into being in what's called the transactional space between two people and their dynamic interaction. Now, a dyad is a pair of individuals in this kind of dynamic partnership, often characterized by strong contrasts in approach and brutal honesty in the way they deal with one another. Dyads are extremely common in creative fields like music, literature, and painting, but they also appear in practically every other collective that you can think of in industry, technology, religion, science, research, and politics. Now, one of the best-known dyads, at least in my generation, is the partnership between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Although they often wrote independently, and many Beatles songs are primarily the work of one or the other, almost all of their songs are the result of the work of both songwriters. Sometimes one would sketch an idea or a song fragment and take it to the other, who would add a bridge, write the chorus, finish a section, speed up the tempo, or just change things around. When John Lennon was asked in, about their creative process, he emphasized their differences. He said, Paul provided a lightness, an optimism. While I would always go for the sadness, the discord, I would include the bluesy notes. He described this process as writing eyeball to eyeball. And working in this way, together the two men wrote more than 180 songs. It is one of the best known and most successful collaborations in history. And much like Lewis and Tolkien, these opposites thrived. Think a little bit about some of these partnerships or these dyads. I was very uh, interested to find out that Sigmund Freud did not come to many of his ideas on his own, but did so, again, in the transactional space uh, between him and another. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, right, the origins of Apple, happen in a dynamic and often tense friendship between two men very different in temperament and out outlook. Um, Vincent van Gogh and his brother Theo, very strong in their partnership, uh, very dynamic, and the work uh, that we uh, tribute to Vincent van Gogh is actually a collaborative work in its essence. I'm amazed by how many different um, realms of invention are marked by dyads, how much all of us owe to this pattern. The iPhone in your pocket, the right for women to vote, the invention of the airplane that provided a way for me to get here all the way from, what, what, was, what did you call it, the country of California? <laughs> all of these breakthroughs were the result of dynamic pairs, partners with different strengths and complementary points of view. Maybe you can think of others, perhaps people that you know, pairs of people who have accomplished something amazing and who then became the core of something much larger, something that changed our world. Now, some of these were rocky partnerships. Not all of them ended well. But in the meantime, the rough magic of these friendships became the core that formed some unbelievably beautiful accomplishments, founding organizations, spearheading political reforms, 
leading medical breakthroughs and making beautiful music? Why are friendships and collaborations like this so very important? Why do they work so well? And what lessons can we learn from them? There's so much to say about these kinds of dynamic pairs and the ways that they catalyze important breakthroughs, but I want to zero in on just one aspect of it. It seems clear to me that we are all created by God to connect with one another and to bring out the best in one another. That, I think, is why it is so significant that we gather together here, in person, in this auditorium, for an event like this one. And I am so grateful for the organizers and the volunteers and their sacrifice of hours and creative thought that went into providing all of these riches for us. It seems clear to me that getting together like this is an important part of the way that we were designed physically. And here's what I mean. In trying to understand what made the inkling so successful, I've been learning a little bit about two concepts, the mimetic impulse and what are called mirror neurons. One of the most important breakthrough studies on this subject was done back in the 1970s. Researchers were very interested in discovering more about how babies learn to talk. And so they did a series of experiments with this, and what they discovered in essence is this, that babies learn a lot from their environment, but they learn much, much more from one other person who holds them and looks at them. They were able to determine that there are measurable gains not only in linguistic capacity, but actually actual physiological changes that take place in young infants when they are held and gazed upon eye to eye. Isn't that extraordinary? Our physicality hardwires us for being together, even at an event like this. But here's the startling discovery that those researchers made. Here's what surprised them. The babies weren't the only ones that showed measurable gains in their intellectual capacity. The caregivers also grew and changed in their understanding, in their empathy, in measurable ways. Well, there's a great deal of work to be done in understanding these processes better. I think we can say with some confidence that God has made us for community. He designed us for each other. And when we meet and work together, laugh together, worship together, and listen and learn together, we live out an essential aspect of God's design. What is clear is that when people collaborate, they change in measurable ways. It's fascinating stuff with tremendous implications for understanding the whole creative process and per perhaps for understanding our lives, families, neighborhoods, our participation as citizens, and the way we work, worship, grieve, and celebrate. Tolkien, Lewis, and the Inkling Stand is a dynamic example of what is possible when we make connections and devote ourselves sacrificially to one another's highest good, there's other recent research, uh, lots of findings more recently, and if I could boil it down to two consistent ingredients that make all of this possible, that characterize successful creative breakthroughs and successful dyads and small groups like Lewis Tolkien and the Inklings, here they are. The first is that the people involved need to be different, quite different in their knowledge base and skill but also in their temperament and the basic ways that they interact with knowledge itself. That's what causes the growth, the differences between them. And the second is this. It is essential that in order for these dyads and small groups to be successful, that they set aside regular time of meeting together without an agenda. Just face-to-face -face time with nothing particular to do it is one of the most important ingredients for God, how God has designed us 
and how our gifts can be catalyzed and well used. So here's what I want you to remember. Creative accomplishment is a messy process. It is not neat and it is not simple. It's a kind of rough magic. But often at the heart of it is the simplest and most basic thing in the world. People who are different in important ways, who make time to meet together regularly, faithfully, and intentionally in order to see what might happen next. Let me explain it this way. That's the lobby of the Eastgate Hotel in Oxford. And that's where Tolkien and Lewis usually met for lunch on Mondays before the start of the Inklings. That lobby, that lobby is the heart of all that the Inklings became. That lobby is the, at the foundation of the creation of the Lord of the Rings, the writing of Out of the Silent Planet, the Screwtape Letters, Mere Christianity, the Chronicles of Narnia, and dozens of other world-changing books. And what started it all was a simple decision for two men to meet for lunch every week and see what God might do next. As a matter of fact, it was in a setting like this that these two men first decided together to give fiction writing a try. The year was 1936, and Lewis and Tolkien were unknown and largely unsuccessful outside of the halls of the university. They weren't really recognized outside of that particular circle. So one night they got together and they got to talking over drinks. And Lewis turns to Tolkien and he says, Tallers, there is too little of what we really like in stories. I'm afraid we shall have to try and write some ourselves. <laughs> now I tell my students, I say, this is sort of like a bunch of film students who are watching the last installment of the Star Wars series. And as the credits start to roll, one of them turns to the other and says, you know what, that was a good movie. There aren't enough good movies like that out there. Let's go make one. Grab your iPhone. Let's go. <laughs> it, it, was a, it was crazy. It was a crazy idea. But Lewis and Tolkien actually took up that crazy challenge. They tossed a coin. Literally, they tossed a coin. <laughs> And Tolkien got assigned to write about time travel, and Lewis got assigned to write about space travel, and they grabbed their coats and off they went, each one determined to write their very first novel. Now, Tolkien started in um, that night on a story called The Lost Road. Like a lot of Tolkien's projects, this one kind of ran away with him, uh, and he never finished it. But later in his letters, he reflects that the kernel of that story and the preparation that he did in attempting to write that story ended up laying the groundwork for what became the Lord of the Rings. Lewis was a bit more successful. As a result of the wager from this spontaneous spark, this dare, Lewis wrote a space travel book called Out of the Silent Planet which begins, as you may remember, with a philologist who's getting lost on a walking tour because <laughs> he hasn't planned meticulously enough. I do not think that is coincidence. Out of the Silent Planet was successful, and at the publisher's urging, Lewis followed it up with two more science fiction books, Paralandra and That Hideous Strength. This is one of the cases where we can point to a specific conversation, one conversation that set in motion an entire lifetime of publications and insights. From that friendship, from that dynamic interaction, not from one person, one leader, no, but from the interaction itself, from the transactional space that was created as those two met, a larger group of writers gathered, the Inklings, Robert Havard, a local physician, Charles Williams, an editor at Oxford University Press, Warren Lewis, C.S. Lewis's brother and a history buff, Adam Fox, a well-known poet. Nineteen members all together became members of this group. The characteristic or quality of this group remained the same. Rough and messy and honest and magical. 
the yoking together of differing strengths, different interests, and very different temperaments. Now, there are a number of implications of this, a number of ways that we can harness more of this magic in our own lives, in our own writing, our own scholarship. Let me mention two ideas here. The first thing I'd like to mention is, uh, is actually something about the inklings. So if I were given a magic wand, I would change some of the things that people keep saying about the inklings. C.S. Lewis was not the center of the inklings, but neither was Tolkien or Williams or any other individual. The center of the inklings was the friendship itself, the collaborative energy, the transactional space between Lewis and Tolkien, and that magic spread in widening circles as they explored literature together as part of the coal biters, as they committed to spend time together on Monday mornings, and as they took risks to share their ideas and stories with one another, being honest in encouragement, in praise, in correction, and in criticism. I think that's the first big takeaway I would underscore this morning. We need to change the way we think about the inklings and the way that we talk about their interaction. And here's the second. Perhaps we can recognize that we also need people in our lives who are fundamentally very different from ourselves, who counterbalance our limits, who challenge our ingrained tendencies, who correct our blind spots, who expand our point of view. As we look over our list of Facebook friends, as we think about the blogs we read, the podcasts we listen to, the news we follow, even the music we listen to, maybe we need to think like an inkling, embrace the uncomfortable and the unpredictable. Maybe we need to go out of our way a little bit and talk more with people who are not like us. And when we do to do a better job, as St. Francis encouraged us so long ago, to be patient and to seek first to understand and then to be understood. It's a messy business. It might be a little uncomfortable. It might be really good for us too. As we learn something new about the bigness the wildness of the kingdom of God, as we glory in our differences. And as, instead of trying to just resolve all, all our tensions, we do a whole lot more to learn from them. Tolkien got it right, I think, in The Lord of the Rings. The fellowship works together and is successful because they are all so different. Different nationalities and cultures, different sizes and shapes, different abilities, the different parts that gather together to create a coherent whole. Um, in some ways, not so different from the people that are sitting around you right now. Like it says in Ephesians 4, each part of the body is indispensable to the whole. You, you here, you here today, you are indispensable to the whole, each one of us. This event would not be the same if you were not here. Each one of us has such an important part to play in the work that God is doing. Because each one of you is a beloved part of God's work. as the Inklings worked together. Their differences in personality, perspective and gifting stimulated fresh thought, encouraged creative risk, and inspired new directions. They went out of their way to spend time with one another and to listen and learn from what each other had to say. If we are to function as the whole body of Christ, if we long to be productive and fruitful in the work that we do, if we hope to continue to be creative, innovative, and significant, we should be encouraged to think like the Inklings and do the same. That is their legacy. Thank you.